And it turns out, Joel, that 80 to 90% of the time, it's actually you're getting these kinds of opportunities, not these kinds of opportunities. So you actually, though there's a lot of good opportunity in the market, why get engaged in something that's going to stress you out and have a hit or miss 50, 60% or 70% chance? That's hard on your psychology. That's where you need trade psychology, but you don't need trade psychology when you know you're going to be right eight, nine times out of 10. So we actually say no because we're looking for opportunities that are not likely to lose money. We say no to these opportunities, and that's 80, 90% of the opportunities we see. And only 10 or 20% of the time, we'll see these ones go, ah, very low risk for it to continue to go further away from demand. I'll take these ones. And then I'm right and have these easy, peaceful profits that have a very high probability of working out and not stressing me out along the way. <laughs> Hey, what's going on, everybody? Joel Irway here, and welcome to another very special episode of Experts Unleashed. And I am super excited uh, because today I've got a very, very special guest for you here today, Roger Corey from investingfortoday.com. Now, Roger is the founder and CEO of investingfortoday.com, and over the past 10 years, Roger has enabled his clients to outperform the market by having a level of insight and analysis that provides 80 to 90% accuracy so that his clients have clarity, control, confidence, and certainty in their investment decisions. Now, that level of accuracy can allow his clients to compound their accounts over a three to five year period that provides meaningful and life-changing results. Roger, I'm excited to chat with you here today. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Very happy to be here. Now, Roger, I'm going to play the the role of the MC and the co-host here, uh, as the ho as the host, I should say. And uh, like my role is to basically just, um, I, I've been in the investing game for a while, right? So I've I've uh, I've studied the markets, I've done options trading, I've done buy and hold, I've done mutual funds, like you name it, I've probably done it, right? But the one thing that I really love about um, about you and about your values and about your missions when it comes to investing is what we said earlier is confidence clarity and certainty and so i'm excited to dive in because especially in today's day and age you know there's none of that in the marketplace i mean here we are in uh you know in the summer of 2022 and like if you look at the stock market it's just it's it's up it's down it's way down and then we get a little bit of a recovery and so we're in a very very uneasy time right now so I would love for us to kick this off and I want to, um, I I'm curious to hear really like your background of like how you discovered this and how you ended up, uh, at this place right now of focusing on your values of confidence and certainty and clarity and control. So tell us a little bit about how you, you got into this. So actually I started, um, I got excited about the whole trading for a living, trading from home, trading from anywhere, just a laptop and an internet connection. And back in 1996, that was when the whole trade from, for a living kind of revolution took off. And I got excited, started kind of investing in the best possible education I could put my hands on. And um, what was interesting was over time, you know, I kept finding myself, you know, following rules, being disciplined, doing my part. But then whatever I was working with, whatever I learned, whatever training, tools, systems that was provided, education, it would work for a while and all of a sudden it would start to work inconsistently or poorly or not at all. And I'd, I'd find myself going after what, you know, the next new thing and what's working now and version 2.0 and that really, and it becomes very addictive, especially for someone who like if people who have success in their lives, they come to the markets to figure, okay, I just need to get myself educated and I'm, I'll be successful here. And so it's very difficult for you to, um, engage in something like this and be met with some inconsistency and inability to have a reliable, repeatable process that you can sustain long term and have a consistent outcome that you can take to the bank, right? So you're you're always starting and stopping and, and, and going after the next new thing. And so I did that for 14 years and, and I find out most people, I, I get people that come to me after 20, 25 and some 30 years, still not consistent. Well, so for me, it was 14 years and over $300,000 and just educational costs over that period of time that I put to teach myself. That doesn't even include the losses that I took, but it's probably very valuable and painful lessons. Um, but one day, I really thought that I finally found something that can give me some consistency and some certainty. 
Um, and yet again, it broke my heart. And I was so livid that I just, I snapped and almost punched my monitor. <laughs> okay. I was going to break my computer. And I, and I said, you know, okay, I just held myself. And I, I was like, there's no way I can, I got to get, get out of here. And I literally, I went to the beach. Um, and there's a, there's a, a place called Silver Strand Beach in, in Ventura County, California, that I love because it's not a it's not a very touristy place, so it's not very busy, but it's a sur popular surfing point. You can and it's nice and it's paved. You can sit on the bench and you can actually just watch the ocean, listen to the ocean waves, calm down. <laughs> and I think that day I was just I wanting I was wanting to just distract myself and calm myself down and get myself my, get my mind off things. And I noticed that there's these 17 surfers that were out in the ocean, and but there was two out of the 17 that were off to the left. And I thought, hmm, and as I, as I was watching, I figured, because they, they weren't really surfing very much, uh, but the 15th kind of the, the huddled close together, kept taking wave after wave, you know, crashing and burning, getting some good rides, just trying, persevering, striving. And these two would like barely take any waves. And I thought, okay, those, those gotta be some amateurs, probably beginners learning from the 15 that are, are probably regulars. And as I was kind of watching and observing and going through my thoughts, thinking, looking, and about an hour, an hour and a half into it, I noticed a very interesting pattern. The two guys who were off to the left, they never seemed to have a bad ride. Every time they took a, a surf, they had a really nice, sweet ride. It was just great. They weren't crashing and burning. And it hit me. I was like, wait a second. Those are the professionals. And the 15 were the ones that are kind of amateurish and just still working at this because those guys seem to be thriving, not striving. <laughs> and I was like, and, it, and I had this like lightning strike moment, you know, it was, it was an epiphany. And I had figured out that those guys had some way to filter out what waves were not likely to give them a bad ride. And they'd only take those. So they weren't very active, but when they were, it was golden. It was sweet. And I could not wait to get back home. I rushed back, almost got a speeding ticket, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that and that literally was my pivot point. Um, because then I realized everything that I've been doing it was just you know yeah I learned a lot. It seemed great, but it wasn't really serving me because it wasn't giving me the consistency that I needed. And so. I threw everything out that I thought I knew about the markets and I came at it with a whole different approach. How do I figure out what is not likely to lose me money versus looking for these opportunities that can make me money and they look good on the surface and then they, a lot of them disappoint me um, and, and they cause me to struggle and fail and get stuck when holding on to large drawdowns and you know, all these things. And so I started focusing on opportunities that were not likely to lose money, but I was still struggling. And all of a sudden, I don't think it was like even a. I'm, I'm sorry, I want to jump in. You said, you you started to focus on on things that you shifted your focus on things that didn't weren't going to lose you money. Explain that again. Can you? I just wanted to make sure I highlighted that. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. Most of us are very wired and very naturally are geared towards looking for opportunities that can, you know, give us an edge make us more money. Uh, it's a good deal. It's a, you know, we're, so we're always focused on things that can take us from where we are to where we want to be. We want to go higher, we want to level up. Well, it's very natural, but it's actually counterproductive because interestingly, when we do that, it's no different than if you are, uh, you know, wanting to uh, get someplace in your car and you're so focused on getting through the intersection, you see it's about to turn red, but you're, you know, you're going to just make it so you're pretty confident that by the time I get to the intersection, it'll still be yellow. I'll be fine. Well, that focus of what I want to get out of this narrows your field of vision, and you're no longer really paying attention to as you get closer to the intersection. You're not going to notice the fact that there's a truck coming, that they're not – the way they're coming at their light, they're not stopping for their red light. They're going to hit you. They're going to run through the – they're going to run a red light and T-bone you. And that's going to have an accident or a life altering event, you know, or maybe you missed the police officer that's that, that's on the other side that you could have seen if you weren't so focused on just getting to the intersection. Now you got a ticket. So it's a sour experience either way. And so I realized what if I was focused on not so much getting to the intersection, but making sure that nothing's going to impede my ability to get through the intersection and get to where I want to go safely, get to my destination. So I switched from 
looking for opportunities to make money to let's look at for opportunities that are not likely to lose money. And that changed everything for me. That was the starting point that fed kind of the next, um, I'd say, serendipitous event that occurred to me about a week later. Yeah. I mean, so just to kind of <clears throat> recap that, it's instead of focusing on the big wins and the big opportunities, which right? We all know that's the gam gambling mentality, which if you want to gamble with your life savings, your retirement or whatever, I mean, that's go for it. But like, you know, I, you know, the, the downside is obviously far out, out ways the, the upside. So your shift went from no longer focusing on those big wins, those big opportunities to now let's focus on avoiding those setbacks, avoiding those disasters and avoiding those, those penalties that will, that will set us back. Yeah, because otherwise you're not going to get consistency. It, it, see, I think it's it's more important to focus on a reliable, repeatable process that is going to thrive and survive anything for the as long as you want to be involved, rather than getting these big hits. You know, you know, people constantly ask, you know, what do you think is good now? They're, and they're, I know what they're thinking about. They're thinking about put some money now in six months, twelve months, a year or two from now, it's going to make me a lot of money. That's very speculative. And that's very traditional, normal thinking. And this buy and hold idea, Warren Buffett days, even Warren Buffett says, I can't replicate the success I had because that was in a unique time in our country and in the evolution of industry and all this stuff. It's just, it's not that way. So buy and hold really has become more speculative than it is conservative. And we think, well, we justify it by saying, well, markets always rise, inflation's always increasing. Sure, but what they're not thinking about is the timing. What if when I want to pull out or when I need to access my cash, what if the market has taken a 20, 30, 40, 50% dive? What if it's gone into a bear market? Do you know the Nikkei has not yet recovered? For, it's it's like it, it had a high and it's been going down. It's been in a bear market. It's never come back to its old highs again. So what if it just doesn't recover? We've been very fortunate. We've been spoiled here. But that that we can't rely on things we don't have any control over. So I wanted something I can control. I could reliably repeat with consistency and have confidence doing it. So I'm not being driven by fear and greed, which are destructive forces, right? The main element that I was struggling with, it's uncertainty over what's most likely going to happen next once I enter a position. So I wanted to, I needed a way to overcome that where I knew before I committed my capital what I can expect and be confident I'm going to hit my goal. So I'm not sitting there struggling with stress and fear. And that's mm -hmm. a miserable way to make any kind of money, right? So what happened a week later, did you know that there's a surf report? I never knew there was a surf report. I never paid attention to it. And here I live in Southern California at the time. And I just, maybe because I'm, I'm not a surfer, but because I, those surfers were in my mind, you know, recently, the guy says, this, today is surf report. I'm like, surf report? So all of a sudden it shifted my attention. And lucky me, because that day the anchorman was triggering the weatherman and saying, that's so amazing. I always thought it was just like, you know, you look at the you know weather and see if it's a good day for surfing. There's so much more. It's like, no, no, no professional surfer worth of salt would do that. They look at the surf report, see the see the the wind, the the the, the surf, uh, and all this. I mean, I was like, he went through all this stuff. I was like, wait a second. And he be, it, when he got triggered, he started explaining all the environmental factors that go into forecasting very accurately what you can expect for surf today and all, you know, all that goes into that. And I was like, wait a second. And they do that daily. And 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 and, he's, and he says, so, um, and one of the things that he said that was profound was like, you know, you could look at the surf report over the next two or three days, but, you know, you're going to get the most accurate report the day of or the day before, right? Because you're closer in time. The further you are away from a forecast, the less accurate it's going to be. And I thought, oh, what a profound shift. It's like, wait a second. So I began taking that and I said, what are the environmental factors that are affecting price movement? What causes all price in any market, okay, whether it's crypto or equities or, or, or commodities or currencies, it doesn't matter, right? What makes price move? Demand. Well, wait a second. What are the forces of supply and demand? What, what's, what is that? It turns out most, well, I, everyone that I know, including the professionals, focus on either fundamental analysis right and any of the subsets yeah. that kind of are related to fundamental analysis and or sometimes they they do one or the other but sometimes they do both they'll use technical analysis in all of its various forms right like elliott wave gan fibonacci and using all the technical indicators we can see on a, on a price chart and all these things 
But there are six other major forces of demand. You have geopolitical forces, you have volatility, you have market sentiment, you have liquidity levels, which includes volume, order flow, trade flow, and all these things that banks and smart money use. And so people have these strategies for order flow. That's just one more factor. You still have five other factors. Um, you've got what I call prime pools of liquidity, which are these squishy areas between in a price zone where only a, a, an institution or a broker or market maker will know there's kind of an elasticity, that level of support, let's say, or resistance for those who understand support and resistance, um, that they can manipulate the market with their weight where they can put, throw an order in and run people's stops. So people have a stop loss. They'll, they'll, they'll hunt their stops. They'll get a better price average, knowing that the overall weight of the market is going to carry things back up in, the, in their direction. So people who are left behind their computers are going, oh, I just, it's, they feel very personally persecuted, right? I got triggered and the, went, the market went without me. Well, once you know where that is, now you can take that into account. You're no longer a victim of these sudden whipsaws and these stop hunts. You can actually be very confident going and knowing, you know what, I can ride that coattail and I'm on, on the other side of where the market can be manipulated. And as long as there's enough reward, at least equal or more reward than what I'd have to risk, and I know I have an 80% probability or better, I'm golden. I, that's a no, that's a low to no stress position. So I started working that out. And as I figured all that out, I started to look at how do I combine these together so it's not so overwhelming and complex and complicated every time I want to do analysis. And it's kind of like imagine how many things go into having your your AC temperature, you know, on your wall tell you that it's 72 degrees, you know, and it tells you, but the temperature in the house is is 80, you know, so, oh, there's a difference here, 72 to 80. So I, I know that if I turn the, the, the AC on, I'm going to, I'm going to have, you know, six degrees to come back down to, to 72, you know, or, 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 if, or excuse me, if the, if the, if we want the house mm -hmm. to be at 72, we have six degrees to get there. Right. Um, and so the idea is I've got a, I've got this, um, input here that tells me that I've got something, some data that I've got to deal with. Here's my output. Here's what I'm. Here's what I want. Or here's the input of what I want. Here's what I have to deal with. How do I bridge the gap? And so, I think you know. Let me use this rubber band because I think this really makes the best sense. So when you see visually, let's say here in my fist, I've got this is rep this represents demand, and this other side represents price. Well, since demand is always a leading indicator, right? It's always where demand, if it's increasing or growing. Well, what happens? Price goes up. When demand is contracting, it's decreasing, it shrinks, price goes down. So price really is a lagging indicator. Now, when you use fundamental analysis or technical analysis, it's, it's, we're, fo we're price focused. We're, it's, it's the price of things. Well, price is a lagging indicator to demand. So, and then we use these technical indicators that are lagging indicators because they're derived from price. That's a lagging indicator on top of a lagging indicator. And so you're inherently at a disadvantage. So if we can shift our focus away from the price of things and start to focus on the demand, where the demand is, and we have a way, which is the process I ended up developing, which is how to analyze demand in real time. Because if I know where demand is, right. I know where price is going, what it's going to do next. Now, the, the, the part of that is understanding that price has also this elasticity. So a lot of people focus on the opportunity of, oh, I see prices uh, at a good area where it should snap back and go to this other area, you know, so they, so they get in long or short, you know, but they're not thinking about there's other factors that they have to know about that may cause price to move continually away from where the demand is at. And so what I what we talked about demand and balance arbitrage is understanding where there's a significant imbalance, where it's so stretched out, price is so stretched out that statistically the odds are not in favor of it continuing to move away from demand. It's going to have to snap back and catch up to demand. Those are what represent very low risk, very high probability opportunities for profit. So we're arbitraging or taking advantage of the difference between that significant imbalance from where price is to where the actual demand is. Now, Roger, yeah, I want to I want to jump in here real quick because this is fascinating stuff. Um, I want to uh, so before we really dive deeper into your methodology and your system of demand and balance arbitrage, like I want to kind of close the gap and close the loop of like you know 
when you first discovered this, right? You, I mean, you, you put in years and hundreds of thousands of dollars into training, you know, leading up to you discovering demand imbalance arbitrage, like, but paint a picture of like the stark difference of like what those results were when you shifted to this methodology. So people just understand where you came from and, you know, what happened before and what happened after you discovered this. So like, what, what were those results? And I know, Obviously, we can't guarantee anybody's going to replicate these results, but I want them to see what happened to you so they can you know, understand that consistency, certainty, yeah. and clarity is king. So what did that look like for you? Well, I went from having a stress-filled, I didn't know, okay, I see a good opportunity. I'm not sure. Now, when I get into it, I have to commit to it. I say, I like it, so I get in, but I don't know whether it's going to work out or not. I have to wait and see what happens. That's very stressful. And I can get tripped, right? I can get a sense where maybe it's not going to work out. Maybe I should move my, my, my stop. Maybe I should exit. Maybe I should. And this arguing and, and, and second guessing is really self-destructive. And there's no way to have any control over that. So I went from having inconsistency from, a, from total subjectivity, uh, a lack of clarity to having a level of certainty where all of a sudden I had a, had a, I had a, a level of control over both my experience so I wasn't stressed along the way. I was actually enjoying all of a sudden what I was doing because I had a very high level of confidence that I knew that I had an 80 to 90 percent level of accuracy that I knew that my decision now, before I had to commit, I actually knew whether this good looking opportunity was actually going to work out or not before I was committed to it. And I only engaged in those where I knew I had an 80 to 90 percent probability of hitting my target. And I never took more than two percent or less really of my account capital in terms of my downside risk. I never held on to large drawdowns, these large downturns. I never took big risks, no longer needed to because I had that clarity. So all of a sudden I had control over my performance outcomes as well as my experience. I had consistency rather than a hit or miss experience. That roller coaster was gone. I had a, just a steady incline. Um, and I, you know, nothing's hundred percent, but you don't need it to be when you're right 80, 90% of the time. You have a very, you actually, you know, what's interesting Joel, is the risk reward paradigm says this. This is what everyone lives by. If you want higher returns, you have to be willing to take higher risk. And if you don't want a lot of risk, you want less risk, then you have to be willing to accept lower returns. You're not going to do as well. Well, having a grasp on demand in real time, what's it doing versus where price is at and approaching the market that way, suddenly it flips the risk reward paradigm on its head where now I can reduce dramatically and limit my downside risk without limiting or restricting my upside potential that changes everything and do it with consistency and with confidence and i have a level of control so that's really the contrast i went from hit or miss to having consistency confidence and control no more uncertainty about what i was going to expect before and after because even after you get into a position the market can sometimes have something dynamically come in well you would see you know demand is up here and price is down here. So I know I've got a very strong probability for price to come up and, and hit my target. But if as price is coming up, it's halfway up and going, we're doing good, we're doing good. All of a sudden, demand starts to shift down and shifts below. Well, demand always moves first and then price moves after. So that, that lag, because price is lagging, that gives me enough time to take defensive action and go, wait a second, I'm not going to hit my target. Something is shifted in real time. I can see that and I can exit what essentially is going to end up becoming a failed trade while I'm in profit, before it turns into a loss. Do you know how the psychological impact of that to know that I've just walked away with a profit on what ended up being a failed trade? So, so now we're, we're so we're let's 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 go deeper now into demand and balance arbitrage, right? So, because um, that was that was interesting. So you're profiting from failed trades, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, because you no longer have to guess. Oh. Uh, it seems to be struggling. Uh, maybe it's going to recover. Maybe it's going to bounce back. You don't have to have any of that. You actually know because you can see physically, you can, in real time, you're seeing the physical demand shift. You know, just like in the way that I've done it is I, I've, I've taken all those outputs and I, and I combined them into like, sort of like, you know how complicated, all the complications of what it makes your, you know, what makes your car work. All you have to look at is, you know, am I running hot? You look at your oil gauge, you know, is it in the kind of where it should be, the temperature of your car, and then your fuel gauge and your you can go and have a very confident experience. You're going to go from where you are to where you want to be right now. And it's as objective as sitting in your car and knowing that my target is I want to have, I want to take a 250 mile road trip. 
and I sit down and my car shows I only have a quarter tank of gas in. Well, anyone who has any experience will tell you a quarter of tank of gas will not give you 250 miles. That is objective data. There's nothing that's subjective about that. It tells me I need to stop and refuel. I don't have to drive off with stress wondering when my car is going to peter out and, and, and stall all of a sudden because it ran out of gas. I know. It's, a, it's visually that intuitive and that simple. So though these all these you know factors seem like it seems like it's a lot, but actually I can do my analysis in like in a minute, literally. Okay. And I know I can, because it's visually intuitive and I see what the market is doing, where the demand is. And so if demand Tesla several weeks ago was up at a thousand dollars, but we could see visually that the fuel, what's fueling the market, the demand, all the buyers, all the sellers combined, the interest, the demand in the market was, had shifted down to the 700s. So you had plenty of time while the market was up at retesting the previous highs around a thousand, you knew you were going to get a 30% correction. You didn't have to second guess that. You could see visually demands down here, prices up here. That's not sustainable. It's going to have to snap back. And so now we have a way to also, for those of us who are not just focused on generating cash flow and building an account, but actually who also have some long-term retirement money, even they can access this model to help them avoid these double digit corrections and, and sudden crashes that can't happen unless the environment is conducive. I mean, Joel, think about it. You and I can't walk under a clear blue sky and have it start raining on us. We would see clouds rolling in, getting darker, the, the temperature would change, the pressure would change. All these things are identifiable and they take time to build. And because they're identifiable and they take time to build, it makes them forecastable. So we're no longer sitting here being victimized by some surprise sudden event. We can know what to expect. And, I, and I'll, I'll take it one, one, one little further to give you an example. Chipotle Mexican Grill a few years ago had that E. coli breakout. People were dying eating their food. That's not anything you can predict, right? And the market, that stock crashed from 700 to like 500, 400 something, right? Well, it, it, we don't have to predict and know that there's going to be an E. coli breakout when that market's going to crash. The environment, if you do the analysis, you'll see the analysis was showing a demand before the E. coli breakout happened had shifted down to the 500s, but people were still kind of excited about Chipotle Mexican Grill. And all it took was that trigger of the E. coli breakout, and very suddenly it crashed to the 500s, right? You would see that demand shift, I think it was like six to eight weeks prior. So you don't need to wait for a trigger to know, hey, I have to take defensive action or I have to lighten my load or I can profit from it in short. Well, so Roger, let me ask you this then. You know, how long, is, so there's a couple things that I want to talk about. So number one, Number one, I want to ask you, you know, is this a cash flow strategy or is this a long term strategy? Like, does this work for both or how do they how do they play into your into demand imbalance arbitrage? So once you know that you can actually see demand in real time, now you can go down on a on a one minute chart and take advantage of the cycles and where the price cycles as they're going because of the hundreds of thousands of interactions of, of, of buyers and sellers each day. There's always this natural cyclical move between demand and price. They're always moving. Price is always trying to catch up to demand. And so you see these cycles on a one minute. You see it on a daily, on a monthly. So you can use the same analysis to manage your long-term portfolio as you can cash flowing and generating building wealth. And if you want to uh, take 10, 15 hours a week, whether first thing in the morning, early in the morning, or at night, or during the day, whatever you want to do, and replicate a full-time income because of the consistency that allows you to compound your account something meaningful, you've got that control. If you want to protect your long-term retirement fund, you can call your, if you have a money manager taking care of that, you've got your brokerage account, you can call a money manager and say, hey, take me in the cash, you know, and avoid the 30% correction when it bottoms, get back in and ride it as a gain rather than a financial hole you're trying to fill, you know, make up for, right? Isn't that much more efficient? You have more control. You don't, you're not stressed. You're not thrown and tossed by the winds of you know, the economy. You actually have a level of control. Because why? Because you're seeing demand in real time. As you see shift, expand, increase, decrease, you can make your actions. And it turns out, Joel, that 80 to 90% of the time, it's actually you're getting these kinds of opportunities, not these kinds of opportunities. So you actually, though there's a lot of good opportunity in the market, why get engaged in something that's going to stress you out and have a hit or miss 50, 60% or 70% chance? That's hard on your psychology. That's where you need trade psychology, but you don't need trade psychology when you know you're going to be right eight, nine, seven times out of 10. So 
We actually say no because we're looking for opportunities that are not likely to lose money. We say no to these opportunities, and that's 80, 90% of the opportunities we see. And only 10 to 20% of the time, we'll see these ones go, ah, very low risk for it to continue to go further away from demand. I'll take these ones. And then I'm right and have these easy, peaceful profits that have a very high probability of working out and not stressing me out along the way. <laughs> Roger, that's what you got to call the system. You got to call the peaceful profit system. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that is, that is what like, I'm like, oh, you said peaceful profits like that. No stress, you know, smooth sailing. You know, I, I really like this because you, you, you painted a picture of, uh, of something really, really clear. Like you said earlier, it's like driving a car. Yeah. It's like, how far do you want to go? You want to go around the corner? Or do you want to go drive to Vegas on a 400 mile road trip, right? No matter which way you want to go, like you've got your two core gauges, you've got your fuel line or your, your fuel gauge, and then you've got, you know, the, the engine temperature, right? right? And it's like, as long as you've, you know, for the most part, like as long as you look at those two gauges, 90% of the time you're okay. Correct. Sure. Every time, every, every now and then like, okay, your brake pads might need to be replaced. Like that's not to say that there's other maintenance that has to happen, right. but like you look at your like your daily gauges that are going to that are going to guide you you know keep you on the straight and narrow Precisely. right I, I thought that was a really really crystal uh crystal clear picture of, of of the analogy well let me ask you this question what if you had a full tank of gas to take your 250 mile drive and you're and, and you, as you're starting to drive all of a sudden your temperature gauge shows your car's starting to overheat that's a failed train yeah. right something's i've got enough fuel if something's wrong here, if I don't pull over, I may not get to my destination. My car might, might seize, right? It's my engine's overheating. So that's where I go while I'm ahead. Let me pull in the gas station, you know, before I have a really bad experience. And so that's where I don't have to second guess that. That's objective data. Pull over, right? Or your or your brake pads are making a weird noise. Don't wait till it, you know, chews into your, you know, your, your you know, your pad or what, what do you call that? The, um, the yeah. rotors, right? So uh, my analysis helps you understand what's the environment that I'm in, because I can forecast, I, I can see, okay, the market's going to go from A to B, but I can see that it's stormy now, and that's the, these where they're not stretched out. I can, so do I really want to go run my errands in the middle of a storm? Should I let the storm pass? Because my chances for getting into an accident increase dramatically, right? So why take more risk? And by the way, there's, a, there's some, some wisdom to this too. I always tell people, never do anything under pressure. When you're under pressure, no matter what, how well you know something, you know how to drive a car for years. But if you're under pressure and you're late to an important appointment, you will drive that car more aggressively. You drive it differently. Now your chances to get into an accident, get a ticket, possibly a life-altering event, start to increase. Why put yourself through that? So if, if the market and the analysis tells you this is a you know kind of a, a stormy time, it doesn't matter that you can forecast where the market's going. What you have to endure along the way is going to put you under pressure and you're likely going to veer off the process that tells you what you should do. You're going to have trouble. So no, we're going to say no to those as well. Does that make sense? It does. So it's not about like, you know, get, getting rich quick. It's about consistency. It's not about getting in the market all the time because we know where demand is. No, there's a, there's a wisdom to it. It's about having consistency. What you don't want is the mindset of a, of a, a grown adult to come in this and all of a sudden they slip into the mindset of like what, what it would feel like to a 16 year old who just got their driver's license and dad just bought them a two and a half million dollar Lamborghini. Not a smart or wise combination there. <laughs> OK, we don't want to do that to ourselves as well because we will revert to that mindset in those circumstances. Yeah. So so there was some some philosophy and wisdom to this. And I teach that to, to my clients. Yeah, it, it, it's fascinating, man. I mean, it's you know, it makes a whole lot of sense, you know, it, looking at demand instead of looking at price like price is the lagging indicator and and unless you really understand that i mean it's it's very easy it's easy to get emotionally attached to you know the yes. charts and emotionally attached to your investments and so i love your approach of demand arbitrage and um and so what i'm sorry demand imbalance arbitrage how you spot the opportunities and and avoid the snapbacks right so um i i think it's uh, it, if if I were kind of like starting over or if I were, you know, in the market to uh, to really change, you know, change, you know, the way I wanted to go, go, um, go invest and go trade like this is definitely something that I'm extremely interested in. 
And so um, your website, Roger, is uh, investingfortoday.com, right? So we'll drop a link down below and we'll make sure that people go check it out and, and, and go learn about your system and go learn about your methodologies or work with you directly because you have a really good guarantee, like a really interesting and unique guarantee. Explain what your guarantee is real quick. So if you wanted to learn how to be a pilot, you go to pilot school, you don't have you don't go into pilot school with any doubt or concern. I might not be able to fly airplanes when, I, when I'm done and I've graduated. Right. It, you don't say I'm going to try it and see if it works for me and hope that it'll work out that I can fly airplanes. You go in knowing that there's a very proven process that if you go through the training that they teach you in flight school and you go through everything they tell you to do, that you're going to graduate. And you're going to be able to have a very stable, successful career flying airplanes and navigating through any kind of weather and knowing also what weather you should stay grounded and not fly in, right? So with my process, there's no trying and hoping. Um, and because of that, I know I've seen now, I've developed in 2010. Um, I started, people started asking me, would you be willing to teach what you do? I never intended to teach this actually until people started asking me, it was like a lady at church once and asked me if I would be willing to mentor her son. And the ripple effect that came out of that was so amazing. People, more and more people started asking. And so I took it more seriously and enjoyed it. But um, since 2011, I started teaching it formally. And since then, I've just watched the consistency of people being able to replicate the consistency, the outperformance, the control, the confidence, the transform lives that come out of that. So I know that if you're willing to do what I ask you to do, you're teachable. You're not going to come in with your own ideas and put your own spin on it, but just do what I've asked you to do, what's proven. It's impossible for you to fail. So I can guarantee a person's success. I can get you, they'll come to me and they will, they will be able to be consistent in a sustainable long-term perspective. They're not, there's no version 2.0. You know, since I've developed this in 2010, I've never fixed it. I've never updated it. I've never tweaked it. I've never modified it. It's the same thing because it's based on principles that are always there. Demand will always lead price. So it's like it's as constant as gravity. So I guarantee people success if they'll just do what I ask them to do. And and that's why I go through a whole evaluation where I get to know a person up front personally. It's my life's work. It's my reputation. When they look me up and do their due diligence, they'll see. I don't have negative complaints or negative reviews because I make sure it's a good fit for the person and a good fit for me and make sure that they're not coming to me with pressure or circumstances that will put them in that mindset of a 16-year-old with a brand new Lamborghini who just got their driver's license because there are grown adults who can very well afford my fees and whatnot, and um, but it's not a good fit. I'm not. I'm not willing to take someone and enable them to self-destruct, knowing that they have something that's going to pressure them and not going to be able to do what I ask them to do. Does that make sense? Hundred percent. I love the qualification. So, yeah, it, you don't try and do. You come and you know you're going to get the results. Exactly. So uh, the website again is investingfortoday.com. Go check out Roger and uh, and and. Um, and his training is education and, and hopefully you've gotten a little bit of a taste of just, you know, his knowledge and expertise and, and, and breadth of knowledge in uh, in this space. And so where I want to pivot to right now is I want to go to part two of our interview. And this is called the expert resilience uh, section. And so this is all about. Uh, you know, I've, I've asked a handful of people these questions because I'm fascinated with mindset, right? And so this is all about how entrepreneurs are leading the future in mind, mastery and meaning. And so, Roger. I want to ask you uh, a handful of questions around around this topic because um, it's it's fascinating to me. So the first question that I've got for you is uh, as follows: To be as successful as you are, you've probably had to bounce back from a low moment. So can you take a minute to share with us a down moment in your life and how you practice resilience when that happened? So actually, I had been a, a business consultant um, for most of my, my adult life. And that's really what paved the way and, and funded <laughs> my massive learning curve over the years. Um, and I had built up uh, quite a nice uh, business and, and, um, and I, had to, I took on a partner. And um, eventually that partner embezzled money and, and did some really horrible things. And um, it blew up my life and ripped. 15 years of my life right out from under my feet. And um, I, I had been in some, um, I was investing in some um, commodities and things overseas. And, and so um, it's very the details, but, but it was very stressful to keep managing that. And, and uh, people weren't reliable and relying on other people and things that were out of my control were very frustrating to me. And my brother said, it's, you know, you're killing yourself, you know, why don't you, you know, that's so frustrating that you keep leaning on, you know, you're depending on other people and is, you know, 
you, you're trying to now rebuild your life literally from from almost from scratch. Uh, but why don't you do something where you can have full control and you don't have to gamble with with you know depending on someone to agree with you, work with you, stay honest, stay loyal, faithful to you. You don't have to, no one's going to compete with you. Why don't you go back and find a way to be consistent with your trading? I know you love that. You've been you've been at that. Why don't you focus on that 100% and stop trying this or that and really, you know, and you're, uh, you know, I know that you you believe in God, you have faith. Why don't you pray for him to help you? And I was like, such a simple thing, <laughs> you know, I've always been kind of driven by my own mind and what I can do and what I, if I put my mind to it, I, you know, but I've actually never prayed about help me, give me guidance and illuminate my path and, and, um, and just, and then focus a hundred percent on it now that I'm just in the situation. And I did that. And that was what led me to think that I had something got really angry, boiled over and went to the, went to the beach and saw those surfers that changed. So th you can see that there was actually kind of a very providential yeah. unfolding that happened but that, that, and so this now then gave me the ultimate control, by the way, I'm going to tell you something really interesting about that. Once you have control and confidence and you no longer have to worry about anything competing with you or changing your ability to have what you want, you, you develop a level of peace about your future then, mm -hmm. and a security where um, once you get to a place where you're like, this is my, my, my sweet spot, the, your ambition and drive to need more kind of also goes away and you start to really enjoy the extra free time and you start to enjoy your life. And I really try to impart that to my clients say, don't, don't come to want to trade for a living, honestly. Use the process and, and the consistency of it to, to get you to full-time investing where you can first replicate your income. Once you've done that, take the abundance, the growth, continued growth into uh, investing in things that are passive uh, uh, yielding investments so that you never need to trade. You you never need to be in the market. You're there because you want it. It's an enhancement or you just want to maintain something. So you're never under pressure. We want to have no pressure when we engage with something financial because yeah. it, it, it charges our emotions. Yeah. 100% sure does. And uh, it, you, you never want to take on that gambling mentality when, when you're investing with your future, yeah. investing with your, your uh, <laughs> you know, your nest egg. Um, exactly. All right. So second question, if you had to pick one, what one mindset would you say has meant the most to you? And can you share an example of how that works? So really, um, a lot of people are very goal oriented. And so they think about I want to make this. I want to earn this. I want to have this. I have learned this is so counterintuitive, and I'm, I'm going to get a lot of people really angry with me here. Um, vision boards, dream big, go after your dreams. I have found and consistently seen a pattern in everyone's life that I've, I've ever seen and touched and counseled and me mentored. It, it actually d achieves the exact opposite. It distracts you from what you really need to be focused on. If I have a um, a goal to make X percent per week or per month with my with my activities, I'm going to naturally uh, put blinders on and I'm going to put pressure on, and it's not going to serve me. It's it's actually self sabotaging. Instead of focusing on performance or percentage or dollars, I learned the hard way that you need to focus on the process that delivers reliable, repeatable, consistent results that can compound and deliver what you're looking for. So I tell everyone, don't focus on what you need to make. Focus instead on being a good steward of the process. And if your goal is to apply the process as faithfully and as properly as, as you can, you'll find that the results will not only meet and it, accomplish your goals, they will exceed your needs and your goals because it's the process that delivers results, not going after yeah. my goals. It's the process that delivers those. Does that make sense? hundred percent. I love it, man. It's always about the process. That's, That's like it. one of the secrets to life, like success in life and in, in, uh, in so many things is enjoy the process, enjoy the, the journey there right. versus focusing on the destination, right. focusing on the, you know, the best outcome. Um, all right. Third question. What is something that you or your company does that you are really good at? And do you have any examples? Do you have a story to explain to explain? That? Absolutely. So um, when people come in, I say, don't look for opportunities. Now, you're going to get feel a sense of empowerment. You're going to feel a sense of confidence. I'm forecasting the market accurately. 
just because the market's forecastable doesn't make it tradable. It, it doesn't make it something that you want to engage in. Remember, we talked about 89% of the time, it's too stormy. You don't want to be in that pressure. That's going to cause you to uh, take your, your, your eyes off the objectivity of the data. You start to rationalize behaviors and actions that don't serve you. You want to stay calm away from pressure. So we want to kind of get the 10, 20% that actually are giving, going to give us peaceful, low to no stress experience profits. profits. So um, let's not, we want to shift our focus away from opportunities that are likely to make us money, but the, use the process to enable you to focus on identifying objectively and clearly the opportunities that are not likely to lose money. So I have every client that's come and done that and didn't try to put their spin on or whatever, but they were very faithful to the process, has gone from not only inconsistency, hit or miss, but that consistency allowed them to outperform their, their hopes and desires before they meet me. So they'll come to me and say, well, I would really, it would be great if I could earn this kind of return on average over the year on my, on my uh, brokerage account. You know, great. There's not a single person who hasn't dramatically beat their hopes and, and desires when they focus on the process and looking for opportunities that are not likely to lose money. That gives them a tremendous amount of control and uh, stability that uh, people want. They want that certainty. And when they do that, they thrive. And they're blown away when yeah. they look back. It's like, wow, I'll, I'll get guys routinely that have been in this for 20 years looking for jumping from system to system to strategy to technology. It never does it last. There's always something, that, oh, version 2.0, here's what's working now. They need something that's one and done and it'll never fail them. It's going to be as constant as gravity. And so when they come to me, they they have this experience of, I know I'm doing this, but is this is this real? Is, is there another shoe that's going to drop? Will this stop? And it takes them a few months to realize this is my new norm. It's, um, there's, there's, this is not going to stop. This is how it is. And they get kind of really relaxed. And it becomes a really a form of relaxation for them for many of them. They tell me it's like doing a, a crossword puzzle. I'm not stressed when I do this. I'm enjoying this. This is amazing. So I would say it's that shift. Not, not looking for opportunities to make money, but looking for opportunities that are not likely to lose money and having a process that delivers that with consistency. Love it, man. All right, man. So the final uh, question, Roger, is what is your why? What gets you out of bed every day to strive for excellence? So when I had originally uh, accomplished my own goals and all of a sudden had all this free time in my hands, I thought I was going to go out and just socialize and have a good time and enjoy life. Um, an interesting event happened. My dad's health took a turn for the worse. And I started spending 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week near, next to my dad's bedside. Um, I was very committed to not letting him feel depressed and because he kind of lost his will to live. And it was a very difficult time. And it was miserable for us, put our life's family upside down. But um, I used that time rather than myself, but to, to just be there and support my, my and that, that was that ordeal went on for like five and a half years, by the way. So that was a very difficult and dark time in my life. When people started asking, would you be willing to teach me? I had a handful of hours a week that I could kind of share and kind of get away and get, get a little bit of time and just kind of my little bubble. And it was one of the healthiest, most productive things because it was a bright part in my life because being with an elderly parent, um, taking care of them and health difficulties, it's a, it's a, it just sucks the life out of you. You know, it's depressing, it's hard. And when I would see these transformed lives and what it meant for their families, and I get the ripple effect, I get the gratitude and the love, it, it was so uplifting. I think it just saved me and enabled me to get through that period for five and a half years. And, and when people are willing to value you and all of a sudden you're like, okay, I've, I've accomplished this, but then here, no one ever says like no to more money, you know, especially when it comes in a fun way and in a fulfilling way and a rewarding way. Um, I, I started kind of like, wow, this is just providing like almost, and I, it's interesting because I never had, um, a comfort with taking money from people, uh, you know, cause when you accomplish something for yourself, it, it feels like, you know, you're a little bit too proud to need to accept, but, but I had to learn, it's okay, well, you know what? I figured out a fee structure where here's the value I'm providing. And, and, and if whatever you do with this, I, I'm going to, I'm not going to feel like you took advantage of me. I don't feel exploited. I figured out this is kind of a, a you know, going to make me feel good about what I'm providing for you, giving you my life's work. But I, but there's profit obviously in that. And so I thought, well, what if I could take a percentage of that, figure out what does it cost me on average over a 12 month period to support someone to go from no, from nothing to being profitable and building their account, being able to actually make that the best investment they've made over a 12 month period. 
So I figured out my hardcore costs over a 12 month period. And I said, I want you to carry your own weight. Just carry, just cover the cost that I would have to incur between my time, my overhead, my resources. I'm going to provide you to, to, to give this to you. And then only when you've profited, after you've actually doubled your money on your investment to actually learn this and be profitable, then I'd like to share in your profit. Only when you're profiting, I get to profit. I want 10% until we hit my my cap, my tuition. And then whatever you make after that's all yours. Mm. And that gives me an incentive uh, to my emotions and everything. Anytime they come to me, I have an incentive. I, I want to be there. I'm excited. And now I've, I have equity in that person's success. And I think it's much more intellectually honest. And so that's been such an awesome experience. And the love that I've gotten, I get wives that will call me up. 12, 18 months later, I go, I can't believe what you've done with my husband. Never mind the performance, but he's more patient now too. This process has enabled him to be kind of present when he's with us rather than being with us in his mind somewhere else. He's just, he's more patient. I mean, it changes people. There's personal growth that comes out of this too. So that's very personally gratifying. So for me, my why, my the most fun time is actually being able to interact with people and touching their lives and, and just seeing what comes out of that and, and that response. And, and actually, we've got a client and his wife visiting us for a week here, spending time together. And uh, of course, you and I had, had scheduled this before they decided to come over here. So, uh, but it's, but you'll enjoy relationship with people that they're clients, but they become your friends and become, you know, some of them become like family to us. And, and that's really something that I thrive on. And that's my biggest reason. Yeah. I love it, man. That is, uh, it's very inspirational to just get the ins the insights from people like you, experts like you, to to see what drives them and what makes them tick. And and um, you know, I love the the equity investing with 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 your clients because it makes sense. You know, your results are based on their results, and I think it's a, it's it's mutually beneficial and it's very fair. Um, and so uh, I've enjoyed connecting with you here today, Roger. Your uh, uh, your an extremely bright and extremely driven and extremely, um, you know, uh, humble, uh, you know, entrepreneur. And that's who we have on, on, on experts unleashed. And so, uh, if you're interested in working directly with Roger or learning more about his programs and his education, head over to investingfortoday.com. Uh, Roger, it's been a blast, man. And for everyone else, it's great being here. Thank you for having me. Yes. It's been a blast. And so we'll see you all on the next episode. Take care.